This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. Um, happy Friday. Welcome to uh, this week's Fellows Conference. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Andrew McHugh. Um, I'm sure most of you know Andrew at this point. Uh, Andrew is a native West Virginian who attended the University of West Virginia for undergraduate and medical school, if I'm not mistaken. Came to Atlanta for residency where he was a chief resident uh, in internal medicine and then joined our program. He is currently a third year fellow in our clinical track. We'll be joining the Harbin Clinic in Northwest Georgia next year as a non-invasive cardiologist. And he's gonna to talk to us today about rheumatic heart disease. Dr. Andrew McHugh. Thanks, Robbie. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss uh, rheumatic heart disease, and this is a topic that I've become very interested in after seeing a few interesting cases throughout the three years here at Emory, uh, and even some before then when I was in residency. So I have no disclosures this morning. So our learning objectives for the talk are to review an interesting case of rheumatic heart disease, to highlight some key uh, echo findings, as well as to highlight the presentation and advancement of the disease over time. To discuss the uh, epidemiology, pathogenesis, and clinical presentations of rheumatic heart disease. And then finally, to highlight some medical treatment, as well as indications for surgical and percutaneous management of valvular rheumatic heart disease. So our case, uh, this is a 33-year-old African male from the country of Gambia that presented with shortness of breath and large volume hemoptysis. Uh, he reported that he'd been feeling short of breath for about a week and had some low grade fevers and also had had over a cup of blood produced uh, with large volume hemoptysis. Said prior to this, he had no past medical history that he was aware of. He was raised in Gambia until the age of 15, and then he moved to France where he went to college and then eventually uh, immigrated to the United States. He'd been in the United States for about 10 years. Uh, his family history, his mother died in her 50s from reported natural causes. So he presented in distress, was tachycardic. He had a, a loud diastolic murmur. His chest x-ray you know, showed a multifocal pneumonia versus pulmonary edema pattern. And his murmur led to getting an echocardiogram, which showed the following. So here you can see some of the classic findings of late stage presenting rheumatic heart disease. You can see a very thickened and restricted mitral valve with cortal thickening, leaflet thickening, as well as restricted motion of the anterior leaflet. You can see a very echogenic and thickened aortic valve and a very large, very large left atrial cavity here. Doppler imaging shows significant alicing across the mitral valve consistent with likely mitral stenosis as well as mild to moderate aortic insufficiency across the aortic valve. Cross-sectional imaging here, you can see a couple things. One that jumps out is the D-shaped septum. Uh, this patient had an estimated RV systolic pressure in the 80s, so significant RV pressure overload, as well as a very uh, fibrotic and thickened mitral valve seen here in cross-section. These apical views highlight a ginormous left atrial cavity, uh, as well as the aliasing across the mitral valve and mitral stenosis with strict leaflet motion. He also has a very large left atri or right atrial cavity and dilated RV as well. His mitral gradient was calculated at 18 and a half. His mean peak gradient was 18.5. And using pressure half time, his mitral valve area was calculated to be around 1.1 centimeters, right on the cusp of severe versus very severe mitral stenosis. So the epidemiology of rheumatic heart disease, uh, in 2015, it was estimated that around 33 and a half million people uh, are living with rheumatic heart disease, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia and Oceania. It accounts for approximately 300,000 deaths per year. And I highlight that number because that's 
in the range of how many deaths per year we were experiencing in the last few years with HIV and AIDS. But notably, rheumatic heart disease only gets around a million dollars of research funding uh, as of five years ago, where HIV obviously gets in the multiple billions of dollars of research funding. So it is not getting the attention that possibly it should be. And this is a disease of, you know, usually young people. Uh, the global economic impact of early death from, from rheumatic heart disease is estimated around 65 billion. So it is very significant in most of these developing countries. So the World Heart Federation and WHO set aim to reduce rheumatic heart disease burden by 25% in the year 2025. This was started in the year 2018 when they set out this target. Primarily, they set this aim because it is the most commonly acquired heart disease under the age of 25 in the world. And they have placed focus on prevention with increasing the, the availability of antibiotics, uh, specifically intramuscular penicillin G, as well as research into developing a group A strep vaccine, which we'll discuss more, and increasing the availability of echocardiography in these third world countries for screening as well as just increasing the availability of general medical and surgical care in these countries, which will highlight some numbers in comparison to the availability of medical care in the United States versus these developing countries. So the pathogenesis of rheumatic heart disease is, you know, initially presents as pharyngitis related to group A uh, beta hemolytic strep, strep pyogenes. Uh, it also can present initially as skin infections, such as impetigo, and it is known that there are, are factors in these third world countries that really to increase exposures, repeated infections, most commonly related to house crowding, poor hygiene, and poor access to healthcare. The theories about how it affects the heart, specifically the, the valves and causes valvulitis. Uh, the first theory is a molecular mimicry theory saying that molecules on the infected organisms are very antigenetically similar to molecules on host tissues, specifically in proteins and group A carbohydrates. This provokes host immune system responses that target both, both molecules, both the bacterial molecules, as well as the molecules on our tissues and autoreactive antibodies activate complements for cell destruction. A second theory is a neoantigen theory, which suggests that group A strep gains access to the collagen uh, layers of the heart valves, allowing M proteins to bind to a, a region of type four collagen. This creates a neoantigen that produces an autoimmune response against collagen. And ultimately, the initial damage in acute rheumatic, rheumatic fever is due to antibodies. The chronic damage that leads to rheumatic heart disease is related to a cellular response and complement cascades over many years that leads to neovascularization and fibrosis, specifically focusing on the valvular tissue. This diagram here illustrates the initial response caused by antibodies and antigens, which then leads to multiple downstream molecular cascades that cause fibrosis, uh, neovascularization, and over many years, um, destruction of tissue. So group A strep, will initially lead to acute rheumatic fever in those affected. And it usually presents as carditis, pericarditis, or valvulitis. So the rheumatic heart disease that we're used to seeing is usually chronic findings, but the acute presentation in you know, people that are, are very ill is usually severe mitral regurgitation. It's not stenosis. It is thought that around 70% of people with acute rheumatic fever will progress to rheumatic heart disease. This is an estimated number because it is thought that we a lot of these cases of rheumatic fever are misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed across the world. So in diagnosing rheumatic fever, we use the Jones criteria. They were updated in 2015 to try to increase the sensitivity in third world countries. So they were divided into two subsets, one being low risk populations, as you would see here in the United States, and then it divided into moderate and high risk populations across the world and developing countries. So your major criteria uh, include carditis, arthritis, uh, usually polyarthritis, um, Sydenham's chorea, which are involuntary movements of the trunk and arms, rash, uh, erythema marginatum, which is a pink rash with a halo, uh, kind of a pale halo center that is usually seen on the trunk as well, 
and then subcutaneous nodules. And to achieve the diagnosis of rheumatic fever with the major criteria alone, you need to meet two of these criteria. The minor criteria involve arthralgias, fever, elevated sed rate, as well as prolonged PR interval, which is thought to be due to increased vagal tone and local inflammation um, seen with carditis. Yeah, so you can also have two minor criteria with one major criteria to achieve the diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever. We also use ECHO to help diagnose acute rheumatic fever. Uh, things we're looking for are changes in the mitral and aortic valve, as usually it is the left-sided valves that are affected. Uh, the mitral valve changes you're looking for are annular dilation, cordial elongation, cordial rupture, flail leaflet. Usually it's anterior leaflet prolapse. You also can see posterior, but anterior is more common, as well as beating of the leaflet tips. Uh, acute aortic changes you'll see are focal leaf leaflet thickening, coaptation defects, and restricted leaflet thickening and prolapse. And again, these are people that you're screening that you have a suspicion that they may have acute rheumatic fever. So when acute rheumatic fever progresses and becomes chronic rheumatic heart disease, it, it, you know, it is noted that it is pretty infrequent. Uh, with people having group A strep that they develop these diseases. So it is thought there is a genetic predisposition. Uh, even in endemic areas, less than 6% of people living in these areas will develop uh, rheumatic fever and progress to rheumatic heart disease. It is thought to be somewhat genetic and familial as it was found in a study uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa that children whose parents who had rheumatic heart disease had a 2.9 fold higher risk of rheumatic fever compared to people whose parents did not have rheumatic heart disease. Some of the common clinical presentations of rheumatic heart disease that we see uh, in our practice and new ones at heart failure, and these are again, very late stage findings, um, usually several years after the diagnosis. So new onset heart failure, pulmonary hypertension uh, related to the mitral stenosis, uh, stroke uh, usually related to atrial fibrillation also listed below, as well as infective endocarditis. So as we progress into chronic rheumatic heart disease, there's some echo findings that we also uh, will find that are notable. Uh, the WHO, or I'm sorry, the WHF uh, criteria for diagnosis of chronic rheumatic heart disease uh, involve the, the following. Uh, it is based upon age. Um, so for age less than 20, uh, patients with suspected uh, rheumatic fever progressing to rheumatic heart disease will have pathological MR with at least two features uh, of morphologic features of rheumatic heart disease in the mitral valve. They will have a, a mitral stenosis mean gradient greater than four. They will have possibly pathologic AR and at least two morphologic features, uh, changes of the aortic valve uh, or borderline disease of both the aortic valve and the mitral valve. And again, you only have to meet one of those uh, four criteria for age under 20. For age greater than 20, um, the criteria are very similar. Um, to help diagnose chronic rheumatic heart disease. Some of the morphologic features that we do look for, specifically mitral leaflet thickening, uh, greater than three millimeters for pe people less than 20 years old, uh, greater than four millimeters age 21 to 40, and for folks greater than 40, you'll see thickening of the leaflets greater than five millimeters. You'll also see cortal thickening, restricted leaflet motion, and excessive leaflet tip motion during systole on the mitral valve. For the aortic valve, you'll see irregular focal thickening, coaptation defects, restricted leaflet motion, and uh, leaflet prolapse. And the reason this is all important is because it's the tip of the iceberg. You know, once patients present uh, to rheumatic heart disease causing cardiac failure and symptoms, you know, that is often when we're seeing them, but it's the number of patients with asymptomatic or latent disease that are being missed that we would like to increase the sensitivity of diagnosing these people early so that they can seek treatment, seek appropriate antibiotic prophylaxis, which we'll discuss, and try to prevent their progression uh, from subclinical rheumatic heart disease uh, to advanced rheumatic heart disease with significant complications. The high with a high likelihood of death in the short term, which we'll also go through. So, Primary versus secondary prophylaxis, um, 
you know, primary prophylaxis being when treating group A hemolytic strep infections, including pharyngitis and skin infections. You know, across the world, this is limited by people that are asymptomatic or don't uh, seek care. Um, the need for rapid throat cultures is highlighted here in order to help diagnose group A strep infections so that they can be treated appropriately with, with intramuscular penicillin up front before they progress to rheumatic fever. For those folks that have already progressed to rheumatic fever, the, the goal becomes secondary prophylaxis. And the goal here is to prevent recurrent infections, to prevent recurrent insults that would cause subclinical rheumatic heart disease to progress to symptomatic and advanced rheumatic heart disease where these patients suffer many complications and significant morbidity and mortality. So in looking at secondary prophylaxis, it's thought that penicillin will lead to a 55% relative reduction in acute uh, in recurrent acute rheumatic fever. This is a study done in Africa. It is less known about the rates of reducing rheumatic heart disease. There are new studies that suggest a decrease in valvular pathology and mortality. However, these weren't, they were small studies, they were retrospective. And again, the, the goal with secondary prophylaxis is to prevent recurrent episodes of acute rheumatic fever in hopes that this will prevent advanced rheumatic heart disease and valvular issues. So the antibiotic guidelines, um, preferred treatment um, for uh, primary prophylaxis is intramuscular benzathine penicillin G uh, injected uh, every three to four weeks. This is preferred over oral penicillin VK specifically because of uh, increased uh, compliance across the, the world. It's not thought that people in third world countries are going to take oral antibiotics every day and is hopeful that you know, if they could return every three or four weeks and get an intramuscular injection of penicillin, that it would increase uh, their overall compliance and treatment efficacy. Uh, for those that are allergic to penicillin, erythromycin and azithromycin are an alternative. Um, looking at the, the remedy study, which we'll highlight, uh, it is thought that patients taking secondary prophylaxis are less likely to have recurrent acute rheumatic fever, cardio, um, congestive heart failure, and death at two years. This was a um, statistically significant uh, reduction in rates of rheumatic fever, heart failure, and death. So as far as duration of treatment, this is uh, something that commonly, commonly comes up on our boards. I've seen this question many times um, in board preparation. So what is the recommended duration of treatment? It is based upon expert opinion. Every country seems to have their specific guidelines. Um, our guidelines were developed through the AHA and it's based upon the degree of heart disease. So folks that have had acute rheumatic fever and no evidence of, of carditis, it is recommended to prophylax uh, until age 21 uh, or five years after last episode of acute rheumatic fever, whichever is longer. For patients with acute rheumatic fever and history of carditis, but no residual uh, rheumatic heart disease, it is recommended to prophylax these patients uh, until age 21 or 10 years after their last episode, whichever is, is longer. And for patients that have both carditis and residual rheumatic heart disease, it's recommended to treat these patients until age 40 with secondary antibiotic prophylaxis or for 10 years after their episode, last episode of acute rheumatic fever, whichever is longer again. And for patients that undergo valve replacement, uh, it is recommended for possible lifelong prophylaxis should be considered. So what are some of the sequelae of rheumatic heart disease, the late presentations, and what are the importance of identifying them? So once patients develop congestive heart failure, this is thought to double the risk of death as seen in the remedy study. Uh, patients with aortic stenosis and dominant uh, regurgitant lesions do have a worse prognosis because usually you don't see isolated aortic stenosis. It's usually in combination with mitral valve disease. Atrial fibrillation carries a significant burden. Uh, the AFib with rheumatic heart disease is related to increased atrial pressures as well as atrial inflammation. Uh, between 40 and 75% of patients with mitral stenosis will eventually develop AFib. It is associated with a 40% higher mortality, uh, a two-fold increase in stroke independent of all other risk factors, including the CHADS-VAS score. Uh, the risk of stroke doubles. Uh, 
Um, these patients are usually managed with warfarin. That is the standard of care. There is a trial ongoing currently. It's called the Invictus VKA study comparing Xarelto um, to see if it is inferior with uh, comparison to treatment with warfarin for stroke prophylaxis. Study is ongoing. There aren't any results out yet, but current day recommendations and the gold standard of care is to treat these patients with uh, warfarin. So pregnancy and rheumatic heart disease, uh, this is often, uh, unfortunately, when patients are diagnosed in third world countries as increased cardiac demands and hemodynamic changes occur with, uh, with pregnancy, usually in the second trimester. Um, there was a study out of Africa that showed 34% of patients that had severe MS, AS, or pulmonary hypertension at the time of their diagnosis would, uh, would die within one year of delivery. There is an increased rate of stillbirth and pregnancy termination in Africa related to rheumatic heart disease burden. The goal is to medically manage these patients, treat their heart failure, uh, keep them from you know, having acute decompensated heart failure being in the hospital. Those patients that are having severe MS, mitral stenosis are at the highest risk. And if these patients do need to undergo procedures, uh, it is recommended to do it after 24 weeks um, as to decrease the radiation exposure and uh, decrease the risk of fetal demise. Uh, pregnant patients that do have mechanical valves are preferentially uh, managed with unfractionated heparin in the first trimester and peripartum. Otherwise, uh, they use warfarin uh, for their mechanical valve anticoagulation. Uh, some studies in Africa suggest that the uh, teratogenic effects on the fetus are low if patients are on a dose of warfarin less than five milligrams per day. Uh, those are not guidelines accepted in the United States, but they do find that, that mothers do better uh, if they remain on warfarin throughout their entire uh, three trimesters. However, the increased risk of teratogenic effects is there. Um, there was an increased risk of bleeding um, using uh, low molecular weight heparin, so they used unfractionated heparin mostly in Africa if possible. Um, they do not recommend against vaginal delivery. It is acceptable um, with the goal to shorten, shorten the second stage of labor to decrease the amount of cardiovascular stress and hemodynamic changes. And if they're able to do that, then the recommendation would be to proceed to a C-section. So we'll talk uh, now about some surg surgical and transcatheter uh, managements of mitral stenosis. Uh, the most famous uh, procedure that has been around for many years uh, is the percutaneous transvenous mitral commissurotomy involving the Inue balloon, which is developed in Japan. Uh, this procedure has uh, pretty low immediate risk complications, uh, two to five percent across the board for tamponade stroke and uh, development of severe mitral regurgitation. We'll go through the procedure so you can see why those complications would occur. Uh, it has a Pretty long sustained benefit, uh, over 75% over five years. Uh, the poor outcomes are usually seen with Wilkins scores higher than eight, higher age, or residual valve areas less than 1.75 centimeters. We'll go through the Wilkins score specifically so you can understand why that score is so important in identifying patients that are optimal candidates for this procedure. So if we go back to our patient um, who presented with acute severe mitral stenosis and hemoptysis, uh, he underwent uh, valve commissurotomy. You can see here, he has a trans uh, a receptal uh, puncture here, contrast being injected across the mitral valve and refluxing back into the left atrium and pulmonary veins. Here you can see the Inue balloon, which is a balloon with uh, it's, a, it's a dual balloon. There's a, a distal balloon and a proximal balloon. And the way this works is you insert it across the mitral valve, trying to get the mitral valve in the center of the device. You then inflate the distal balloon and pull it back against the valve to crack the commissures and decrease the degree of mitral stenosis. And then the proximal balloon is inflated to kind of push back against and maximize your valve area um, to decrease the degree of mitral stenosis. So what are the indications for percutaneous mitral commissurotomy? Uh, class one recommendations for symptomatic patients, uh, patients with severe mitral stenosis of the valve area less than 1.5 centimeters, uh, 
uh, with favorable valve morphology, meaning that uh, they do not have significant degrees of MR as well well as going through the Wilkins score to see uh, if their valve would meet uh, criteria for this procedure, and also patients that do not have any evidence of left atrial thrombus. Class two recommendations include patients with valve gradients greater than 1.5, but with significant hemodynamic changes on exercise, uh, including a wedge, a pulmonary artery wedge pressure greater than 25, or a mean mitral gradient greater than 15 millimeters of mercury. Also, patients that are high surgical risk with no other options, um, even if they do have suboptimal valve anatomy, would be uh, candidates for this procedure. That's a class 2B recommendation. Asymptomatic patients, uh, class 2A recommendation for very severe mitral stenosis, valve area less than one with favorable valve morphology, no atrial uh, thrombus, and uh, moderate, no moderate or severe MR or patients with severe MS with a valve area less than 1.5 with very favorable valve morphology and no evidence of moderate severe MR or left atrial uh, thrombus. So going through the Wilkins score, this is something that also again comes up frequently on boards. So what, what, what does a favorable valve morphology mean? Well, essentially it looks at four characteristics of the valves. It looks at the valve mobility. It looks at the subvalvular apparatus and subvalvular thickening. Uh, it looks like the leaflet thickening of the valve as well as calcification of the valve. And as you can see here, based upon the severity of these four characteristics, um, points are calculated and a score of eight or less is equal to around a 90% success rate for um, percutaneous mitral commissurotomy with a less than 3% risk of complication and 80 to 90% sustained improvement over three to seven years. Um, this is known worldwide as the Wilkins score in Emory, often referred to as the Block score. Was Dr. Peter Block had significant con contributions to the to this procedure and the mitral valve anatomy. Um, so this is a score if you're considering patients for um, commissurotomy, you should go through this to look at again the leaflet mobility, the subvalvular thickening, the leaflet thickening, as well as the valvular calcification to see if their valve uh, meets the morphologies that would make them optimal candidates. So looking again at the guidelines um, for indications for intervention for rheumatic mitral stenosis, uh, we'll focus here on patients with very severe and severe uh, symptomatic disease. If they do have favorable valve morphology with no evidence of left atrial appendage clot or the presence of only uh, mild or no mitral regurgitation, uh, it is a class one recommendation for percutaneous mitral um, balloon commissurotomy. Um, for patients that do not have a favorable valve morphology um, and do have evidence of NYHA class three to four symptoms, um, it is a recommendation for mitral valve uh, repair versus replacement, which we'll discuss. So what are the outcomes for these patients? Um, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute followed for uh, 736 patients over four years and found that survival rates at one through four years were uh, 93, 90, 87, and 84% percent, uh, percent respectively. Uh, the event-free survival, meaning free of death, uh, mitral valve replacement or repeat balloon procedure at one through four years was 80%, 71%, 66%, percent, and 60% percent respectively. Uh, a randomized trial in South Africa showed that uh, percutaneous results were favorable as far as increased valve area and decreasing NYHA class symptoms in comparison to closed commissurotomy uh, via surgical approach for patients with appropriate Wilkins scores. So it is preferred um, to proceed with uh, percutaneous uh, procedures if possible um, as it you know, will push the need for surgery down the road. and patients still have great outcomes with, with increasing their valve area and having decreasing in their heart failure symptoms. So if we go back to our case, you know, this gentleman initially presented in, in 2014. If you fast forward four years uh, after his commissurotomy, uh, he presented back with uh, some early heart failure symptoms and has now, uh, as you can see, his leaflets have become much more thickened and he now has developed uh, severe um, mitral regurgitation with an even larger left atrium than what he had at, at presentation. You can also see that his tricuspid leaflets have, have thickened as well. Uh, 
And in addition to his severe mitral regurgitation, his, his aortic insufficiency has also progressed uh, to be in the more moderate range. He's, if you look here at his telemetry strip, he's also now an AFib. Uh, unfortunately, he um, wasn't uh, compliant with medications, developed AFib probably a year prior to, to this echo and had a significant stroke. So he you know, is, is following right, around, right along with uh, the expected progression of the disease, unfortunately, despite um, having access to appropriate medical care. So he was uh, referred back for consideration of uh, surgical valve uh, replacement. And we uh, did a uh, left ventricular gram here that I want to highlight and, and discuss briefly because I've only done a few of these in, in fellowship. And I think it, it's very important that we be able to assess uh, regurgitant lesions uh, via fluoroscopy and angiography. Um, this is something the surgeons prefer more than, than we do, but it's something that still can come up on boards. So you see here, uh, he has uh, a normal EF with significant reflux back into his left atrium, which is highlighted here by this huge structure. Uh, you can even see uh, the thickening and calcification of his mitral leaflets here on um, a single plane fluoroscopy. So how do we grade this degree of, of mitral regurgitation based off of angiography? Well, it's based upon the opacification of the left atrium um, compared to the left ventricle. It's based on the size of the left atrium uh, as well as the number of cardiac cycles required um, for maximal opacification of the left atrium. So one plus MR uh, is considered uh, brief and incomplete left atrial opacification over several cardiac cycles. Uh, there's then rapid clearance of the contrast from the atrium, and the atria is normal in size. Two plus uh, MR is defined as moderate pacification of the, the left atrium with uh, each cardiac cycle. And there is uh, delayed clearance of the atria with several cycles and an enlarged atrium noted. The opacification of the atria never is greater than the ventricle and two plus. For 3 plus MR, uh, there is equal opacification in both the left atrium and left ventricle after several cardiac cycles. Uh, there is then delayed clearance of the contrast, and you'll note a very enlarged left atrium. And 4 plus MR is defined as equal uh, LV and left atrial opacification after one cardiac cycle. So the difference between 3 plus and 4 plus is 4 plus is after one beat, and uh, 3 plus is after several cycles. You also can see some uh, reflux of contrast into the pulmonary veins uh, on 4 plus MR. So then if we move forward to uh, an aortic injection, um, an aortogram, you can then assess aortic regurgitation based upon the amount of contrast refluxing from the aorta back into the ventricle. Um, here we graded this at 2 plus, and the way we reached that conclusion is based upon one plus being contrast entering the LV, um, but clears from the aorta with each cycle. Two plus, uh, there is contrast opacification in the left, ventr left ventricle that gradually increases, but is never equal to the intensity of contrast in the aorta. Three plus, um, contrast opacification in the LV gradually increases and is then equivalent to the aorta. And four plus, again, the difference is it's after one cardiac cycle that the contrast opacification in the LV is equal to the aorta. And this summarizes that um, based upon the auto guideline or other book and the guidelines we use. Um, three plus and four plus MR are considered to be severe. So if you see the three plus or four plus on angiography, um, this, this goes for both MR and AI, it, it is to be consistent with uh, severe disease. So other options, um, since we talked about um, balloon um, commissurotomy, we uh, question has been asked, is transcatheter mitral valve replacement using a, a TAVR valve an option? Well, it's not specifically been studied in rheumatic heart disease. Uh, the earliest of uh, transcatheter mitral valves with valve and MAC study um, was done over 116 patients that were extreme surgical risks. Uh, the results of this you know, were variable. Uh, it was a pretty high 30-day mortality of around 25%. Um, it was thought that over the patients that did survive the initial 30 days did go on to have uh, good one-year mortality. 
Uh, there was a 14% need for a second valve, and around 11% of these patients uh, developed an LVOT obstruction, which ultimately caused other complications. And again, these, these were the initial trials. A, a study that has done, been done more recently that uses the aid of uh, 3D CT guided measurements to help prevent these LVOT obstructions. Uh, essentially, they take a valve and uh, place it in 3D on the CT images to see what the estimated LVOT would measure uh, with the new valve in place. And they use a cutoff of 190, 190 millimeters squared. Uh, and if you're if you have an LVOT greater than that area, um, it is thought that the, the valve will fit well and these patients have had better outcomes. And this is something that continues to be studied, um, but is not yet ready for the mainstream for treatment of rheumatic heart disease. So for patients that do require surgery, um, the question is, should they go for mitral valve repair versus replacement? Um, a study out of Southeast Asia showed that mitral valve repair was preferred. They had improved long-term survival compared to replacement. Um, these patients, it's most likely due to, you know, decreased need for surgery. Um, you know, patients that have valve replacements, you know, the valve will have a certain lifespan and have to go for repeat surgery. So the goal is to, you know, minimize how many reduced sternotomies that these patients will require. Uh, for patients that do go for surgery, you know, many surgeons recommend you know, doing a left atrial uh, appendage ligation as well as a maze procedure to decrease their risk for thrombus as well as atrial fibrillation burden. And again, this is the standard of care in the United States, but in third world countries, uh, it, it is not the standard of care because of the lack of access to care. Um, it's estimated that uh, there are three cardiac surgeons per one million inhabitants in North Africa. Um, then that number drops to one surgeon per 14 million um, patients and inhabitants in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is excluding the country of South Africa. Compare this to the United States, there are 1,300 cardiac surgeons per 1 million. Um, so access to care is a significant problem in these third world countries for patients that do require surgical intervention. We've referred to the remedy study several times, so I just wanted to highlight the, the data behind it. This was uh, probably the, the largest study that has been done uh, prospectively on rheumatic heart disease patients and enrolled uh, just over 3,300 patients that did have symptoms and echo findings of rheumatic heart disease. This is across 25 centers in 14 um, countries throughout Africa and Southeast Asia. Uh, the median age of these patients was 28. Uh, they were 66% female and they were followed prospectively for two years. And this study just highlights the burden of, of the disease as well as the morbidity and mortality. So around 64% of these patients uh, had moderate to severe valvular disease. Around a third of them had congestive heart failure, a third of them pulmonary hypertension, 20% AFib, and around 7% had strokes. The mortality at two years uh, was 17%, and the average age of death was, was 28. Um, so again, these patients, when they were enrolled, the average age was 28, and you know, around 20% of these patients died at two years. Uh, worst outcomes were seen in the countries with uh, lower income, decreased access to care. Uh, worst outcomes were seen in males. And it is noted that 12% of these patients were lost to follow up. And, you know, we can't draw conclusions from that, but, you know, it's questionable how many of these patients you know, were lost to follow up, were lost to follow up because of death and significant morbidity. So in summary, as to why this topic is so important uh, to highlight is, is the disease burden across the world. You know, it has been a, a focus of the WHO and the World Heart Federation um, due to the, the degree of, of morbidity and mortality across the world. Um, the focus currently is on trying to screen school-age children and pregnant women and to increase the availability of antibiotics for um, primary and secondary prophylaxis as well as the access to surgical care as highlighted by this you know, significant shortage of surgeons across these countries. There is uh, research being put towards a group A strep vaccine um, in these endemic areas to try to reduce the uh, initial episodes of, of pharyngitis that can lead to acute rheumatic fever and progress to chronic rheumatic heart disease. Um, they're trying to improve diagnostics, increase the amount of, of, of echo available that can uh, help to diagnose these patients with valvular disease, uh, increase the amount of you know, rapid strep screens um, to diagnose group A strep. And they're also, you know, putting financing towards developing disease registries so that we can, you know, target the areas most in need.
Uh, hopefully, at the end of the talk, you'll be able to recognize the clinical presentations of acute rheumatic fever, um, including using the Jones criteria and the, the echo findings that can lead you towards the diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever. Um, this is something that does commonly come up on boards and, and should be able to be recognized. And hopefully, we've you know, accomplished this talk, um, we're talking about antibiotic prophylaxis and chronic disease management, including both surgical and uh, percutaneous uh, treatment options. So with that, does anybody have any, any questions? Thank you, Andrew, good review. Um, let's have a couple comments real quick. Uh, one is um, the, um, uh, just for the fellows out there listening, particularly those that will be taking the boards in the not too distant future, this is, um, highly fertile soil for board questions. Uh, rheumatic heart disease, one of those things they love to ask you about because they think you don't know very much about it. Um, so particularly antibiotic prophylaxis recommendations and, and calculating Wilkins scores are, uh, you can almost guarantee those will be on the boards in some uh, form or fashion. Two, um, uh, you didn't go too much into anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation in these patients, um, but right, it's obviously uh, these would be patients who are sort of, particularly a lot of our young, right, I think for the most part, we throw the CHADS VASC score out the window um, just because of their high thromboembolic risk. Uh, any comments on that, Andrew? No, I think that Chad's Vasque is thrown out the window um, because, you know, as found in the remedy study, these patients were, you know, twice as likely to have stroke, all risk factors aside, you know, as far as Chad, Chad's Vasque's um, concerned. So, you know, I've I've seen in my practice in talking with Dr. Dollar and, and some of the other um, clinicians at Grady and Clinic that, you know, anybody that has increased left atrial size, evidence of alveolar disease, um, starting these patients on anticoagulation even prior to developing AFib um, because the likelihood of them developing AFib and having a, ha having a stroke down the road is so high. Um, so for people that are lower um, bleeding risk, I think that, that that is entirely appropriate. Andrew Elena uh, Dolmatova has a, a question about rheumatic fever in adults. Uh, any, do you see anything on that in, in sort of the non-pediatric population? Or is this just sort of an anecdotal rare finding, like uh, she saw a case of a 40-year-old that had rheumatic fever? Did you come across any data about that? It's usually seen in people under the age of 30. Um, so somebody presenting with the acute rheumatic fever at the age of 40 would certainly be an outlier. Um, you know, it is, it's, I don't think there's many case reports out there at all of people having it over the age of 50 from what I saw, but it is a, a disease primarily of the young. Um, and the reasons behind that are not, not clearly understood. Just to <clears throat> follow up on what you were saying, Andrew, on the anticoagulation. So, and I, to be honest with you, I, I don't pay attention to the guidelines because I disagreed with them for so long. I think they may have caught up with what I do, which is to use anticoagulation in anybody with moderate my, rheumatic mitral stenosis, regardless of their rhythm. Um, and that's both because they, they have such a high propensity of going in AFib down the road, but also because in moderate and especially severe MS, you can have left atrial appendage thrombus and sinus rhythm. You don't need to go into AFib for that to occur. And atrial systole becomes almost non-existent when the atrium gets to be, you know, seven, eight centimeters in diameter and, and blood is so stagnant just from the, the stenosis that it's a, it's a real setup. And, and uh, the other follow-up is, <clears throat> you, know, you know, as most know, I do a lot of work in Ethiopia and the population of Ethiopia now is pushing 90 million and there are exactly zero cardiac surgeons operating in the entire country. So there's some visiting uh, crews that come in from Europe and the US and they actually have a hospital that's set up to accommodate that, but there are no full-time surgeons in the country. So it's a tragedy. Um, Andrew, uh, this is Logan. Uh, I just have like an anecdotal thing also. Um, when I, about the anticoagulation question. Um, yeah, so in 
I've done work in Kenya and we saw a lot of uh, rheumatic mitral stenosis and we went, the decision to anticoagulate was solely based on their left atrial size um, because, you know, we did not have access to things like Holter monitors or vent monitors where you could really screen the people for the development of AFib. Um, and so we would anticoagulate solely based on the severity of the MS and the left atrial size. I think that's entirely appropriate because their stroke risk is so high. I mean, unfortunately, the patient in this case um, you know, wasn't compliant with anticoagulation, even though he was recommended to be on it, given his you know, seven centimeter atrium. Uh, and he had a stroke and, you know, then subsequently was found to be an AFib after that. So, you know, you wait too long, these patients will have strokes and have bad outcomes. Drew, Andy Smith, uh, when my friend Rob Paul sent you down from West Virginia as a fourth year medical student, you, uh, you have not disappointed us. So, um, great talk. A couple of comments. One is, um, with rheumatic uh, heart disease, the valves that are affected are the mitral aortic, tricuspid, and pulmonic in that order. And people have sort of questioned why that is, and I don't think anybody knows for sure, but it may have something to do with um, the stress that the valve sees, as well as the size of the valve. So the, so the mitral valve you know, at closure sees systolic pressure and the aortic valve closes with diastolic pressure. So the mitral is exposed to a higher pressure. Um, the, uh, as we're talking about pressures, another thing that we see with severe mitral stenosis is those patients can have severe pulmonary hypertension that may in fact appear to be not reversible, but after mitral uh, intervention, over the following two years, you can sometimes see those pulmonary pressures come down. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the modern things that we do in bringing atrial pressures down is in our advanced heart failure patients with LVADs who have um, pulmonary artery pressures that are not acceptable uh, to undergo heart transplantation. Sometimes with LVADs, um, over time, the irreversible pulmonary pressures become reversible. Um, and uh, the, the comment about the um, atrial fib, the, the risk of, of uh, stroke, uh, potentially even in sinus rhythm, um, I think we also see that in patients who have very advanced um, amyloid heart disease. Um, that, and there's a, you know, a low threshold to put patients with advanced amyloid heart disease on, on anticoagulation. So, um, and I see Dr. Winger's on the uh, call. I, I, I think as looking at the history of cardiac interventions, the first um, mitral procedure was actually performed in 1923 um, on a 12-year-old boy who lived about four years. Um, the, uh, it wasn't until the, the 1940s that Dwight Harkin um, as well as the surgeon uh, in Philadelphia started to do finger uh, mitral uh, commissurotomy uh, to relieve mitral stenosis. Um, but certainly um, a lot of pioneering work that's gone on in bowel disease over the years and, and some things are successful and some aren't. Um, and you know, our, our bowel team here is, is, uh, is doing a lot of pioneering things as well, uh, including uh, last week, putting in a uh, bovine uh, uh, valve into the tricuspid position for tricuspid valve replacement. I think it's a valid point, Dr. Smith. I mean, the patient that once he, when he underwent um, balloon commissurotomy, his, his left atrial pressure went from, from 24 to four uh, as, as soon as the, the balloon was, um, was, was inflated. I mean, the, the the degree of pulmonary hypertension these patients develop is significant, and and I think that there certainly is some suggestions out there that it can be reversed. And um, that's interesting. Your comment on the why the valves are affected the way they are, I think that that's a, a very interesting theory as to why the mitral and the aortic are the most commonly affected. Let's Andrew, this is. Oh. 
this is Nanette. Let's go back a little bit to acute rheumatic fever. And one of the features that was emphasized early on by the people who studied it was the mimetic nature of the acute rheumatic fever episodes. So that the patients who had rheumatic fever without carditis, even if they had recurrent rheumatic fever, were unlikely to have carditis. The ones who had carditis with the initial episode typically had carditis with a recurrence. And that really is some of the basis for the recommendation for the duration of uh, prophylactic antibiotic therapy. We've seen here a number of patients who had acute rheumatic fever in their 30s, but it wasn't an initial episode. And it was typically the people who had had prior rheumatic fever, had had carditis, and again, had carditis with their recurrence. Andrew, just one other comment about, uh, you know, we, in our advanced heart failure program, we see these patients who've had multiple valve procedures, replacements related to rheumatic heart disease, um, where the valves often don't appear to be that bad, but the patients have really advanced heart failure. Um, and whether that in part is that they develop myocardial stiffness or problems over time, or whether just when you have multiple valves, um, you know, in, in series, that it leads to worsening heart failure. Um, but sometimes the, the hemodynamic status of the patient, their clinical status is not what one might predict just looking at the independent valve issues alone uh, following intervention. Kunal, did you have something you were going to add? Yeah, Andrew, I was going to echo um, what Dr. Smith was saying. One, great job on the presentation. Um, and then two, in the amyloid patients, um, there is data to say, it's not great data, but there's data that says if your mitral valve A wave inflow velocity is less than 30, then those patients tend to have higher risk of embolic events. And so that's something that I um, will keep a keen eye on, on all the echoes. And if I have somebody, even though they're in sinus rhythm, if their airway velocity is less than 30, then I'll strongly consider anticoagulating them because of this electromechanical dissociation that we see in these patients, probably similar to mitral stenosis patients. Okay, well, uh, thank you everyone. Thank you, Andrew, fantastic talk. And I uh, look forward to seeing everyone uh, next Friday. I believe we have a talk next Friday and then we're off a couple weeks for the Christmas and New Year's holidays. So I uh, look forward to seeing everyone next Friday. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.